to everything. I like to warn everybody. Uh, my nickname on the farm is Squirrel. I'll be in the middle of a sentence. All of a sudden, something clicks. I go do something completely different, and I never come back and finish that sentence. I tell you that um, because if you guys have any questions at any time, feel free to cut me off with a text, um, a message on here, and ask those questions. I want you to be able to take as much of the information as we give you uh, and go home and start growing your own food. The ultimate goal of our farm and kind of our motto is the more people we can get to grow their own organic food, the better off we all are. So we really enjoy sharing our knowledge and experiences as well. And am I talking too fast, guys? I have a bad habit of doing that as well. So here on the screen are just some examples of things we've grown. Um, for any foragers in the page, you're probably going to recognize a couple of these. The one at the very top left-hand corner is a chicken of the woods. Two native species here to Minnesota. It's one of uh, one of the safe mushrooms where there's no look-alikes. Um, it's kind of a fun mushroom. We often stay with friends when we're doing events in the cities. Um, and in exchange, they'll come camping in our front yard because we live 15 miles from the nearest town. Uh, but they don't like mushrooms. So my wife, being kind of a smart aleck, took some of the chicken of the woods, put it in a paper bag in the back of the fridge for a few days, kind of dried out a little bit, and then it takes an egg dip really nice. So she actually breaded it up and served it to them as sweet and sour chicken, and they absolutely loved it until they found out what it was. But that's one of the very few wild mushrooms we'll identify via pictures um, if you guys had questions on that. Uh, the bottom right-hand corner, we have our uh, pink oyster, one of the very few tropicals we do. It's kind of our spring and summer fun seasonal. Uh, almost no mushroom flavor. It's really more of a novelty. They're from Indonesia. I uh, really start to die at about 40 degrees, so definitely not Minnesota hardy. But it's kind of fun. If my daughter has friends over who are entertaining, we'll throw a few on a pizza the last few minutes. It's cooking or an Alfredo. It just stays bright pink, and it's kind, kind of fun. In the center there, you guys see a wine cap, uh, which looks fairly similar to some of the um, native mushrooms we have here in Minnesota. We'll kind of go into that in detail in a little bit, but that wine cap and then the lion's mane, that fuzzy looking guy in the top right hand corner are two mushrooms you should really avoid if you have alcohol allergies. And then we have some shiitakes on the left center, left bottom, and then of course our shiitake log rose, and then the uh, the white morel. So kind of a word of warning, every mushroom is edible, some can only be tasted once, kind of goes without warning. A lot of the information on this slide we'll kind of just skip over fairly quickly. Um, we only got about an hour here, but every year two to three people die from mushroom poisoning. It's usually somebody like me who thinks they know what they're doing. Most people are smart not smart enough not to put something in their mouth if they're completely sh not completely sure. Uh, 19 people get attacked by sharks and 37 people die of lightning strikes. So there's actually more poisonous and deadly plants than there are mushrooms. We just tend not to go looking through the woods for our salads. If we take nothing else from this slide, it's really that bottom paragraph that's most important. Mushrooms by nature absorb, assimilate toxins, and break down um, things in the environment so that they can complete the carbon nitrogen cycle and plants can uptake those nutrients again. So there's actually products out there that will let you grow an edible mushroom on a roll of toilet paper. I'll let you stop and process that just for a second. So it's important when you're eating mushrooms not just to know what they're growing on, but what's been in those areas in the past. Otherwise, safe mushrooms, like morels are my favorite example, um, that have been grown in areas that have been heavily sprayed with chemical pesticides, herbicides, um, fungicides, things like that, can actually concentrate some of those uh, environmental contaminants into the fruiting body of the fungus, that mushroom itself you eat. So we really recommend staying away from old orchards um, where those uh, no longer legal chemicals have been used in the past. Train tracks, of course, we want to stay away from. Golf courses um, can be problematic as well. So even if you know that wild mushroom you're eating is for sure that particular safe mushroom, also be cognizant of what it's grown in and around. And even cultivated mushrooms can cause allergic reactions in some people, just like any other food. The first time you try it, it's called the rule of thumb. Try a piece uh, about the size of your thumbnail, make sure it's thoroughly cooked, and then wait a couple of days before you try any more. So even morels are mildly toxic until they're cooked. Also remember those wine caps and those lion's manes from a couple slides back. People with allergies to hops and alcohol um, should really avoid those. Those can be problematic. 
consuming large amounts of alcohol and those types of mushrooms can have uh, an accumulative effect as well, we'll kind of touch on later. But here's my favorite point in the whole presentation, guys. This is where you all become mushroom snobs. So we raise 40 types on the farm. We don't raise buttons, portabellas, creminis, or psilocybins. Psilocybins, of course, are illegal. Those are those magic mushrooms. But all four of those types go really best on a well-rotted pasteurized manure. And that whole pasteurization of manure is not a process we want to do here on the farm. They're also really not economical on a, on a small scale like we are. So every button mushroom, portabella, or cremini you've eaten, especially buttons on a salad bar, has been grown on basically straight manure. That's not dirt you're brushing off the bottom, unfortunately. Handled multiple times and picked by hand. So mushrooms are very, very delicate, and they harvest, or they ripen, rather, over a few-day period. So every mushroom you've ever eaten has been picked by hand, handled multiple times, generally not washed, before it's cut up and put on that salad bar for you to enjoy. So if nothing else, as a matter of hygiene, we recommend always cooking your mushrooms before you eat them. And honestly, it's one of those do what I say, not do what I do, because I'll be walking through my shiitake rows, and oh, this one's not quite a perfect prime mushroom, and I'll pop it in my mouth and keep going. But I know what that mushroom's been growing on, and I know what's not in that uh, fruiting body of that fungus. We often get asked, how do I kill that mushroom in my yard? I keep mowing over that mushroom, I kick it over, and I can't kill it. Well, that's the equivalent of trying to kill your apple tree by picking the apple. The mushroom itself is really just the fruiting body of that fungus. It's, it's sexual reproduction. It's how it spread its spores, the equivalent of a seed. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do to get rid of the mushrooms in your yard, which actually isn't necessarily a bad thing. They can help with nitrogen fixation, break down uh, some of the dead grass clippings, and make those nutrients available for that, uh, that turf again in the future. So if we haven't lost you or bored you yet, who wants to learn about the life cycle of a fungus? This is kind of my favorite line, because usually when I'm in front of a room full of people, you see about half of their eyes roll, and the other half get really excited. So we'll skip through this fairly quickly. The mushroom, of course, in the center, the fruiting body of that fungus, we're all familiar with that. Uh, most of us are familiar with the spores on the right-hand side there. That would be the equivalent of a seed. That's going to have the genetic variation between generations. So when a spore lands and it finds the right environmental conditions, it starts dividing. Divide cells turns into hyphae. Hyphae forms into mycelium uh, through divisions and a matting process, depending on the type of fungus. What's not on this slide, and I can't seem to come up with one, is between mycelium and that little pinhead of the baby mushroom there, what happens is that mycelium pulls together very thickly, forms a mat, and starts to develop a texture. It's kind of a primordial texture that will eventually become the pinheads if that mushroom matures. So we want to remember the, the basics of this life cycle here. Spores, hyphae, mycelium, primordia, and then that pinhead, which forms into the, the full mature fruiting body of that fungus, which is the mushroom we eat or mow over in our yard. So as we go through this presentation, it's going to start out a little tricky, but every time we progress, the technique in which to grow your mushrooms is going to get easier and easier and easier. So I don't want to discourage you guys early on. Which brings us to my favorite type of mushroom on the planet. And it's kind of a loaded question when people ask, well, what's your favorite mushroom? Well, we raised 40 types. What am I going to cook? But if I had to pick one favorite on the entire planet, it's going to be that orange guy on the slide on the right, right in the center. There's three different sizes and shapes. It's called a lobster mushroom. It's native to Minnesota. And it's kind of an anomaly in the fungus world. So the picture on the left is our buddy, the vomiting rusula. Its name's pretty self-explanatory. Thousands of types of rusulas. Um, some are poisonous, some are deadly, some are edible. Big difference between poisonous and deadly. Uh, what happens is that rusula's mycelium is pulling together and starting to form that primordia, which will eventually develop into that fruiting body. It gets parasitized by a different fungus altogether. That parasitizing spore takes that rusula, which is a very soft, delicate mushroom, traditional gilled cap and stem, really, really squishy and turns it into the lobster mushroom by changing its physiology completely. So it is no longer a soft, squishy mushroom. It is now a very firm mushroom. The gill surface gets eaten away by the parasitizing fungus, turns into a very hard, poor surface, so that can spread its uh, spores that way in the wind. So it takes something that's otherwise inedible and turns it into something we have yet to be able to replicate consistently. 
And that's also the lobster is one of the very few I'll identify wild mushroom via pitcher as well. And on the right there we have a bolete, uh, king bolete. Um, porcini is a type of bolete as well. And on the left there of the right slide we have a little wine cap. So this leads us to the absolute least effective way to cultivate a mushroom. And again, guys, it gets easier as we go. So for those of you that have foraged, you've probably been told you pick that mushroom, you put it in a net bag, and as you walk, you kind of spread the spores as you go. Well, we actually do the completely opposite. The success rate of a spore is so minimal. Um, to give you guys an idea, a giant puffball, which kind of looks like that beach ball in your yard or ditch, just a giant white mushroom, which is edible. It's kind of the white bread of the mushroom world, in my opinion, not a whole lot of flavor. They produce trillions of spores with a T, that many. Um, so when we're out foraging, which we don't do a whole lot, um, usually it's checking the mail or checking the wine cap beds or the morale beds, we'll actually pick those mushrooms up and put them in a plastic bag. We'll bring them back to the house, and right before we cook them, we're going to lightly rinse them real quick in a bowl of warm water. Uh, that way the mushrooms don't get soggy before we cook them. And we've also trapped those spores in that liquid. We'll also usually rinse the bag we bring them back to the farm with in that water as well. The more spores, the merrier. We'll take that little uh, bowl of water, uh, put it into a five-gallon bucket, top it off with about four or five gallons of warm water, room temp is fine, and add a natural sugar source like a honey or molasses. Now, what we're doing is the equivalent of nearly activating yeast. Any of those spores that are now viable are going to start to open, germinate, start dividing cells, turn into hyphae. And after about 48 hours, we see a nice little light froth around the edge of that bucket. And I'm the kind of nerd that I'll fill up my backpack sprayer with that lobster slurry we have. And I'll start walking through the woods and spray all the russula beds we see. Now, we did this about four years ago, if I recall correctly. Uh, the following year, we had a dramatic increase in the number of lobster mushrooms we had. However, I have no way of knowing if it was a good year for lobsters or because of my efforts. What's interesting is we may have inadvertently screwed up their life cycle because we had none last year and just a handful this year. So it may have turned out to be detrimental. Perhaps next time we try this, uh, we'll do just a smaller section of the uh, 10 acres we have under cultivation right now. But the same thing will work to a certain degree with the morales, which is what everyone seems to be interested in. Uh, here's your random fact for the day, the uh, white morel, golden morel, yellow morel, same thing, different common name depending on where you're, we're at, Memorcella anyway in Latin, in the top left hand corner is actually Minnesota state mushroom. We were the first state to have a state mushroom. Now, to my knowledge, no one has been able to successfully and repeatedly cultivate a white morel. Under incredibly controlled conditions, uh, there's been several people that have gotten them to fruit once. But even replicating those conditions have not had repeated success. And the reason is um, they develop a symbiotic relationship with a deciduous tree um, through mycorrhizae. So that spore lands, turns into hyphae, finds a host tree, they pair up and they start working together. Uh, the fungus is going to help bring moisture and nutrients to that tree uh, in exchange for a little bit of carbon. So that fungus can be living with that host tree for years or decades until that tree becomes damaged, diseased, or begins to die, that fungus really has no motivation to reproduce sexually by sending that mushroom up to spread the spores in, its wind, in the wind. Um, that's why foragers, you're going to say, aha, there's that light bulb moment. When we go out in the woods, we look for areas that have been logged, areas that have been heavily disturbed, dead, damaged, diseased, and dying trees. And that's the reason behind that. Sometimes you'll have a tree um, cut down on your property and a year or two later you start to see morales. I would highly recommend keeping as much of that stump intact as possible and if we have a really dry April we've been known to run soaker hoses around the base of stumps just to encourage that, uh, that fungal growth. On the bottom right here we have a fire morale which is a type of black morale. Now there's 60 to 80 types of morales depending on what PhD you want to argue taxonomy with and this is still a field that uh, is under some intense study uh, Chris Wright from Michigan State, who uh, who really helped us get our feet under us when we were starting this, uh, gave us a bunch of that to play around with. Lucky us, we're the coldest part of the continental U.S. Yay! Um, on the positive side, we got to play around with some of the strains from Michigan State through him, and it's it's been a fun uh, fun experience. So there's only two types of morels that we're aware of that do not rely heavily on the mycorrhizal relationship, that symbiotic relationship with a deciduous tree. It'd be the fire morale on the bottom right 
and the landscape morale on the top. So I know I tend to go through uh, these presentations fairly quickly, guys. A lot of the information we're covering is freely available on our website as well. Um, again, our goal being share what we can with everybody once we get it figured out. So if you'd like, I'm actually going to go ahead and put a link to the website uh, in the messages here as well. And a lot of the information we're covering tonight is a free PDF download. So the fire morales, uh, bottom right corner. Well, they normally have a, a three to four year life cycle, at least the strains we've been playing with. They kind of grow on a bell curve. So their job in life is to kind of clean up after that forest fire, break down those carbons, um, let those nutrients become uh, readily available for plants again. So when we do that, we till an area about four foot wide by 12 foot long. Think square foot gardening for mushrooms is kind of what we've been playing around with up here. But we till fairly shallowly uh, in an area surrounded by deciduous trees that has a bit of a break in the middle. So they do get, do get a little direct sun at a few points during the day. Uh, we till just, just deep enough to disturb the surface vegetation, and then we put a fresh layer of ash and char down. We're kind of simulating a forest fire. Where we're at, we're basically on straight sugar sand um, to the point where we occasionally water our driveway so we don't choke. So we found tilling a little peat in that mix to help retain moisture uh, leads to a faster spawn run or a faster establishment time for this. So once we get that area prepped, what we're putting in that bed is not the spores. We're not planting seeds. We're working with live mycelium. Uh, we're basically only working with vegetative cuttings. So we put this live mycelium directly into a carbon buffet. Uh, we do that in the spring. Uh, if we do it early enough and the environmental conditions are right, we expect the fruiting the next year. Occasionally it takes a couple years to get established. Uh, once established, they produce uh, fairly good. Normally their second fruiting year, third fruiting year, and they kind of taper off their fourth. But what we've been playing around with is instead of making one bed that's 4 by 12, we started making three beds that are 4 by 4 with that one bag of spawn. And we'll inoculate or plant all of that live mycelium one year. After our first harvest year, we'll add ash and char to the first bed. After the second year, we'll add ash and char to the third bed. And after, and, and kind of keep that process going. So we have some of these beds that are still alive at that seven, eight year mark, uh, which is kind of fun. We've nearly doubled their life cycle. But what really has us entertained is that landscape morale, that other black morale on the top right hand side. That guy will occasionally fruit in the fall. We haven't had that much luck with it yet. Um, so it's really not a commercially available strain. But uh, the Mortella Importuna is really starting to uh, show some promise with. Um, a project called the Great Morale Experiment. It's kind of an open source thing on social media, Facebook primarily, where everyone's kind of sharing their cultivation techniques, successes and failures, trying to get this guy nailed down. If we get it right, you'll never know. I'll be in the Caribbean the rest of my life, just saying. That one would also be the one that if you ever have landscape mulch brought in, uh, a lot of times we'll get random phone calls in the spring. I think I have a morale that came up with my mulch. It's going to be that guy. If it comes up in the fall after a frost, it's probably not a morale. It's probably a stinkhorn. They look very similar, but smell like rotting meat to attract flies. So the flies spread the spores for them. Mycelium transfer. So mycelium transfer, most common way of propagating fungus. Think vegetative cuttings um, or splitting a rhubarb plant splitting an asparagus patch, same concept. We're just taking the vegetative portion of that organism and splitting it up, replanting it. So this is a kind, kind of a fun picture. You notice in the background through the windows there, it's, it's snow. This is my little sunroom slash office where I do some fun stuff. So every November, I usually go out and grab a few shiitake logs. Um, we end up posting holidays because we have the only grandkids and we're located between everybody. So we get to host like seven holidays a year. It's awesome. But uh, in November, I always grab a few shiitake logs, let them warm up, so we have live fruiting shiitake mushroom logs, so we can go pick our fresh mushrooms for our mushroom gravy for, for the holidays. And the, one of the pictures, a lion's mane. Normally, those lion's manes only fruit in the fall. It's not one on a log based anyway. We can get to fruit on a schedule. They're kind of fickle, late summer, early fall producers. But I'm thinking, hey, this guy's been outside for a few weeks. It's covered in snow and ice. Maybe it's had enough of a cold treatment. So I grab this little one-foot chunk of log, I bring it in the house, I find the first thing I can to uh, set it on, which just happened to be my plate from lunch, still sitting on the counter, no idea why that was there. 
So I grabbed the snow encrusted log, set it on my, my lunch plate, and shoved it underneath the bottom of my potting bench in the picture there. And I squirrel. I totally forget that, that thing is there for like a couple of months almost. So I go to pick it up, and the mycelium had woken up from its little slumber and grown through the glazed plate. There was little tendrils of mycelium hanging out from underneath that plate, trying to work its way into the particle board on the bottom of my potting bench. So when people tell me they're going to put their shiitake mushroom logs on their deck, I try to show them this picture. It will rot your deck. No, you won't get mushrooms, and no, I'm not liable. Um, you want to be careful. Mycelium is a very, very hungry organism. So some of those pictures in the beginning, which we'll see again here in a little bit of our, our mushroom log rows, when we pick a log up that's been sitting there for several months, that mycelium has worked its way in the ground looking for an alternate food source. So advanced cloning. Uh, we'll skip through this fairly quickly. Um, there's a couple points in which a mushroom, like I don't know if you guys can see my mouse right here, but the, the little picture of a mushroom in the top right of that slide with a little arrow, where we can actually take a vegetative cutting of that. Um, it's kind of an undifferentiated tissue. For those of you with an animal background, think stem cells. For those of us in the plant world, our us hort people, think meristematic tissue. It's not sure what it wants to be in life. So we literally just take a cutting of this guy, put it in an auger dish, and a couple weeks later it reverts into mycelium, that vegetative portion. From there we can go ahead and put that into grain spawn. Uh, it's kind of a holder. It keeps it alive vegetatively and not enough to produce a fruiting body. And then we can split it into plugs and sawdust and any other means we want to to propagate. So getting to that point is the hard part. Um, on a mass scale, that requires a flow hood, a hazmat suit, a clean room, and a whole lot of bleach. But once we get into that live mycelium portion, be it sawdust, um, grain spawn, or plug spawn, anything spawn related, is what you're going to use to inoculate you know, your logs or your beds or whatever media you want to use to actually fruit out the mushroom. Once we're there, pretty much anybody can do it. So again, guys, we're a little easier and easier as we go here. So being a sustainable farm, we want to take what we have available or what is a vegetative byproduct or leftover and turn that into food. So here on the left, we have some king oysters growing in some grain spawn. This is something a lot of you guys that want to try a little more advanced technique uh, can do relatively easily. Believe it or not, if you get a fresh enough mushroom from the grocery store, it's really easy to propagate uh, to get that mycelium to start spreading from oyster mushrooms anyway. And a lot of us uh, that like to garden also like to can. So with the pressure canner, you can actually sterilize media. On the right there, we have a shiitake block. Uh, while we can do shiitake blocks, we really only do them at request for large orders. That shiitake block is how they're grown in the grocery store most of the time. When you pay six, seven bucks, so, sorry, I think I need more caffeine. It's been a long day. When you pay six or seven dollars for a little pint of shiitake mushrooms in the grocery store, that's what you're getting. You're getting uh, sawdust block grown shiitakes that can be produced fairly inexpensively, fairly quickly. Um, and I like to compare that to that um, tomato from the grocery store in January. When you grow a shiitake on a log, that's the equivalent of growing that same tomato yourself in your garden in July. There's a very noticeable flavor and quality difference on those. Manure-based decomposers, again, um, we don't do buttons, portobellos, or cremini's. I'm not doing the... Uh, the horse manure, and again, it's really not economically viable for a small-scale farm. Pennsylvania is where the bulk of the buttons, portobellos, and cremini's are produced in the country, and they produce thousands of, tens of thousands of pounds every single day of the year. This brings us to wine caps. Wine caps are a fun mushroom. Again, top picture there. And on the bottom, we have a repeat visit from our buddy, the vomiting russula. So the wine caps are a secondary decomposing mushroom. We can grow these on a bed of nearly any dried vegetative material. So right now we're collecting leaves. We're going to chop them up through the straw chopper and put them right on our wine cap beds. After this frost, the wine caps have started to go dormant, and they'll have a fresh food source in the spring. But when we create a good environment for those wine caps, we're going to get some of the russulas and some of the other secondary decomposing mushrooms in the mix as well. So that's when you want to be fairly cognizant of. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, the, the annulus or annulum, the little ring that hangs around the stem, and the burgundy colored gills and the burgundy colored spore prints, hence the name wine cap, differentiate them from anything else we're going to find native to Minnesota that could be uh, potentially uh, a negative mushroom. Um, 
So they're best when they're young. The ones in the pitcher literally were had probably emerged from that media less than 12 hours ago before that picture was taken. Just for fun, you can let them get massive, and the caps will be much lighter in color when they fully mature and open up, and you can get them the size of a dinner plate. Uh, but the larger ones tend to get very bug buggy and, and mushy in that not edible. So every year, we try to do the same mushroom work and get the most amount of food out of that effort. So a few years back, we had five wine cap beds going, and we decided we're going to try something different. We took all the leftovers from splitting wood on the farm. There was some material that was fresh. Some was a few years old. There was little sticks, twigs, bark, as you can see in that top picture. And we made a bed 16 feet wide by 12 inches across. I'm sorry, 16 feet by 12 feet by 6 inches deep. And normally a bed that large is going to take five, six bags of spawn, live mycelium, to actually inoculate to where it colonize and give you a solid crop. But what we did is we went to Menards and we got a bag of hardwood fuel pellets. We made little two-inch wide rows, 12 feet long. Every 18 inches down that 16-foot wide run, we got those wet. They more than doubled in size. And then we took one bag of spawn and just inoculated those little strips of hardwood fuel pellets and then covered them with a little bit of straw, like you can see in the picture. Well, what happened is the mycelium was able to chew through that small particulate matter in about six weeks. Normally you're looking at 10 to 12 weeks before a wine cap bed will be established once you inoculate. Um, so we had these little wine caps popping up in perfect rows on either side of the straw up and down this. We could walk down, pick them without stepping on anything. It was great. The problem is that one wine cap bed produced over 100 pounds of mushrooms in one season. We had four other wine cap beds. It was to the point where we were giving them to the food shelf. The food shelf didn't want them there for a while. A uh, dollar a pound, and we we're really giving customer two pounds. The co-ops up here wouldn't take them anymore. So we now have four commercial dehydrators, and there for quite a while we were reading a whole lot of wine caps. So remember those wine caps and lion's manes shouldn't be mixed with alcohol. So if you're eating a large volume of wine caps, you know, you know, with breakfast and some scrambled eggs, maybe maybe with supper, you know, a couple times a day for several days, and then enjoy a few beers on your day off, that can lead to gastrointestinal distress. Just a word of warning. Oyster mushrooms. Again, another really, really easy one for people to start with. Uh, you can grow these things on almost anything. Um, Log-based cultivation on the top left there. Um, some of our old, old indoor kits on the bottom left, straw, sawdust. You can actually companion plant these in your gardens just like you can uh, the wine caps. So what's interesting is most oysters are defined by having multiple caps off of one shared stem or growth point. So if you take a look at the pictures, the pink, same thing, the, one of the large clusters on the bottom right out of the boxes. But then you like take a look at the top right. Uh, and that's a phoenix oyster. That one's kind of fun. We grow that in a log, normal growth habit, multiple caps, one stem. We grow that in a straw, same thing. We put that into um, a sterilized wood chip or sawdust media, and it's always singles. And it's kind of a bizarre fluke of nature. That's the only one that does that. Um, another fun point with the phoenix oyster is that's really the only mushroom you can safely cultivate in pine and fir. Uh, while you can grow a chicken of the woods in pine, we don't encourage it. Uh, some people can get an upset stomach from that, uh, so we just steer away from that. So what we do is every year after Christmas, we debranch our Christmas tree that we bought from a local farmer. Instead of buying a cheap plastic one from China, we inoculate that with Phoenix oysters, let it sit in the greenhouse for a couple of weeks to become partially established, and then we add it out to our production rows, and we get four or five years of, uh, of mushrooms just by upcycling our Christmas tree. And then just for fun, that picture on the bottom is the largest single oyster cap we ever grew. Again, that's about 10 inches across. It was kind of fun. The base of that stem was about 4 inches thick. It was a giant sponge. It was almost not even edible. But just, just for fun, we had to try to see how big we could get one. Augmented straw, another great way to start with these oysters. Um, so when we first tried the oysters, we tried that laundry basket method on the left. It's pretty easy to pasteurize straw. You can usually pick up a bale of straw for three to five bucks, depending if you buy it from the farmer or retailer. We cut it up fairly small. 
filled up a laundry basket with it, put a clear garbage bag over it, got it wet, put it out in the sun for a couple hours, took our compost thermometer, shoved it in the middle there, made sure it got to about 160 for at least an hour and a half. Then we let it cool. And then we introduced that mycelium, that spawn into there. A couple weeks later, that whole basket was white. We opened it up. They fruited beautifully. And then that light bulb came on. Why am I eating a something that was grown in a non-food grade petroleum-based product? So the first time we actually fruited out oysters and something besides a log, we didn't even eat them. We switched over to that column uh, tube culture on the right there, which is the same principle that our indoor kits are made out of now. It's just an ultra-pasteurized straw that we augment with different cereal grains depending on the type of oyster mushroom we want to grow to increase the protein and fat content. It's really easy um, to do. Um, you can even do this in your kitchen if you'd like. Uh, it's a little messy, but the oysters are really resilient. So if there's a small amount of green or gray mold that gets on there, you know, the spores we're breathing as we speak, usually they can outperform small amounts of that, and they produce fairly well. Log-based cultivation. So like I said, guys, we're getting easier and easier. Um, if you take a look at the, uh, the mess in our little greenhouse there, uh, you notice the logs on the very left. You can see the mycelium actually on the end of that, kind of trying to reach out and find something else fuzzy to, or something else to chew on. Um, so if the proper trees are selected, it's, it's very easy to do. The species of mushroom you want to grow does determine the type of trees you can use and vice versa. Uh, shiitakes don't work well in poplar and aspen. They're just not dense enough. Unfortunately, we can't use elm, ash, walnut, or tamarack really for anything. The one exception would be the elm oyster, uh, which is much easier to do in an augmented straw. Um, fun part about shiitakes is that's what a lot of people want to start with. It's much from they're familiar with, and they're actually the most versatile. They'll work in any corcus, any acer, so any oak or maple, uh, including box elder, which is a soft maple, and they actually work quite well. Uh, you can even use buckthorn to grow shiitake mushrooms. The drawback is you want something a minimum of four inches in diameter. So if you have four inch diameter buckthorn, you've been slacking. And we can do a lot on logs. And most of us have access to uh, the ability to prune a tree, or unfortunately the last few years we've lost a lot of trees to these storms, at least in the northern part of the state. A uh, big thing is making sure that portion of the tree you're going to use was freshly cut, from a healthy tree. Uh, unfortunately, if a tree has oak wilt, there's nothing really we can do um, except for debark it, kiln dry it, try to contain that the best we can, and turn it into firewood. Uh, once once a tree has oak wilt, um, we can't get anything to grow in that. We've tried uh, just to see if that's another resource we could use. So top left, black oyster, fun one, uh, lion's mane in the center, um, rishi on the top right, we have two pictures of chicken of the woods, um, bottom left and then the right middle, and then a hen of the woods or mataki at the bottom there, and of course our shiitake rose in the middle. Um, the rishi in the top right is one that I encourage everyone to look into. It's a great medicinal mushroom. We can grow it numerous ways. It's not hard to do. For anyone who's familiar with chaga, um, definitely look into that rishi. Chaga is a medicinal mushroom native to Minnesota. It uh, really likes that zone 2 to zone 4. It likes it cold. It grows on birch. Um, here's the problem with chaga. It can take three to five years to grow. If it's harvested correctly when that tree is dormant or semi-dormant in the fall, it can still take three to five years to grow back. Well, in places like California, chaga can go upwards of $100 a pound in some cases. So that's prompted people, unscrupulous people, to go onto state parks, national land, harvest this stuff off year-round, end up killing the host tree just to make a quick buck. So last year the DNR actually changed the guidelines to, if I'm quoting this correctly, say you cannot harvest chaga on any state park for any reason. Most mushrooms you can harvest on a state park if they're for your own consumption, just not for retail. There's some permits involved in that. But reishi has been under clinical study by the FDA since 2012. Last June, the turkey tail and reishi moved into human trials as a cancer suppressant and an immune booster. Uh, and this is something we actually have the links for right off our Facebook. We follow fairly closely. So the reishi is kind of, again, an exception to the rules. Most of these mushrooms are perennial, and the reishi is as well. But it doesn't need a dormancy or a cold period like a lot of these do. So what we do is we'll take a log like the one in the center there. 
about six inches in diameter and two feet long. We'll actually inoculate that. In the spring, that fall, we'll cut that into three eight-inch sections and actually pot it. So just a small portion of that log sticks out of a sand peat mix. What happens eventually is that we'll grow in to fill in the peat. So you can pick the log up out of that 10-inch standard pot, 12-inch standard pot, and all the soil comes with it. So we have little potted logs all over my office right now, and they'll produce intermittently year-round, which is kind of fun. So that chicken of the woods, for those of you that are foragers, uh, if you pick a chicken of the woods off an upright tree or one that's on the ground, you tend to get a lot of inclusions. There's pieces of bark and grass um, and all sorts of random things that minimize the amount of that edible mushroom you get. So this, the two pictures of chicken of the woods are the exact same mushroom 24 hours apart. What we do, and in the picture I have here, I apologize, it's uh, one of our earlier experiments. If you look closely, you can actually see a buried log underneath that. So we'll inoculate a very large diameter log in the spring. The following fall, we'll now bury that about 25% of the way down in the ground. When that starts to fruit, it fruits symmetrically out the top. We've now elevated that from the ground, so we don't have all those grass inclusions, chunks of bark, otherwise unusable pieces. Once we see that start to fruit, we'll actually run a soaker hose down the long side of these logs, these giant rows, and leave that run overnight. That mushroom sucks up all that water and balloons in size. So even the core of that mushroom, that center part, is still tender enough to eat. So we minimize the amount of waste we get from that mushroom. By reducing its grow time, we also get to it before the bugs have a chance to find out it exists. So we have all the inclusions gone, reduce its uh, grow time, increase the amount of it that's edible, and help minimize the bugs. Um, plus, we don't have to worry about wood ticks when we're out foraging that way. So, if we're going to go through the process of felling a healthy tree, um, we're going to make sure that tree, it, we're only going to take what we need to. So I'm going to flip through these next few slides fairly quickly because um, I have an educated crowd, which always makes life easier. So uh, an included bark on the left, that can happen on a branch or in the trunk of the tree. We're going to look for the healthiest tree possible, so we only have to take one if we're going to give this a go. Uh, lateral frost crack on the left, kind of hard to tell if that tree is solid all the way through. On the right, obviously, there's a fruiting body of another fungus. We're not going to want to use that. Uh, on the left, did the tree not heal properly? Um, obviously, then that was a white oak that was hollow. On the right, I hope that one's a solid healing tree because that's one of the plum trees I pruned myself. You can see how that's closing up nicely, so that was a fairly healthy tree. But once we have our logs, be it from a tree trimmer, um, a limb we had to take from one of our own trees, storm damage, or a tree we felled, let's make these manageable. So I think this picture was from 2012. This is when we wanted giant mushrooms. So these logs are three foot tall about eight inches in diameter and are ungodly heavy. The reason you want them manageable, and we're going to get to this again here in just a sec, is once the log is colonized, we can actually force fruit that on a schedule. And in order to do that, we actually have to pick that whole log up. We have to soak it in a tank of cold water, ice water, for 24 to 48 hours. When we pull that log out, it's overhydrated, it warms up very quickly, thinks it's spring, and we generally harvest our shiitake seven to ten days later. So it's a great way to, uh, to get these to fruit on a schedule, being they fruit in response to temperature change. Of course, they're day neutral. Um, but when you're doing 60 to 80 logs that are 80 pounds each twice a week, it's really hard to enjoy that one day off. So now we cut our logs at two foot in length just to make them much more manageable. That way, if you want to force fruit a log, you can put it in a standard Rubbermaid tote or a cooler. It's so much easier. So once we have our logs and we make them manageable, we're going to actually inoculate them. And I'm hoping you guys have some good resolution on your computer screen. Because if you look closely in this picture, again, still a three-foot log, there's 36 inoculation sites. And you can see the plugs that we're using sticking out. So we literally drill in holes, put in the plugs. The plug is the carrier for the live mycelium. That's kind of our root cutting. Um, and then we pound them in. Now, there's a couple of choices of spawn out there, and it really depends on what you're going to do. We try to use plug spawn as much as possible just because it's faster for us to work with when we have hundreds of logs we're doing at once and we have the added cost of payroll. The other benefit to the home gardener with plug spawn is you can just get 100 at a time. You don't have to commit to doing 40 to 50 logs, two-foot logs, that a bag of sawdust spawn would. The spada, spada spawn, the sawdust spawn on the right also requires an inoculation tool. 
So you drill that out, and it's a little plunger device. You shove into that bag, put over the hole, and expel with your thumb or the palm of your hand. We found when you're hitting that plunger with your thumb 25 to 35 times per log, and you're doing hundreds of logs in a day, your hands really don't work so well the next day. I'm not much of a video gamer myself, so I guess I haven't built those muscles up. But the, uh, the plug spawn just works much faster for us. The one benefit of the SADA spawn would be a totem. This is kind of a no-drill method. Now, the examples in the picture are a great example of what not to do. They're fairly thick. So when we do totems now, we only cut those about four to six inches thick. We take that one log, we cut it into wafers, we stack it up, we pack that SADA spawn between those wafers, kind of tack it together, and then literally put a garbage bag over there just to kind of help hold in some of that humidity. The drawback with totems is we can't pick them up and soak them to get them to fruit on a schedule. But it is a lot less labor intensive and we don't have to drill all of those holes. So literally the inoculation process is drilling holes and pounding them in with a hammer. It is not a gentle process in the least bit. So this one is probably the most important picture I've taken my entire professional career. This tells a lot of stories. When we first really got into this several years ago, there's a lot of conflicting information out there as far as the process to inoculate a log, which is where almost everybody starts. It doesn't require technical skills, a pressure cooker, thermometers, nothing. All you get to be able to do is say, yeah, that's this type of tree. Okay, this type of mushroom will work. So there was people out there that said, cut your log down and you're going to season them. You're going to let that log sit there for several months so the tannic acids dissipate and the antifungals go away. Well, we found when we did that, and we've done every method we could think of hundreds of times, on hundreds of logs rather, to really see what is the most effective for our short growing season. And the longer we leave those logs, the drier they get in the summer, which is a bad thing, also the more susceptible to other competing fungus and other microorganisms they become. So when we cut a tree down, we're not going to let that have soil contact. You'll actually see mycelium grow up into that log in a matter of just a couple of days. It's an easy carbon source easy food source for these guys. So in the peak of the summer, July, August, if we're going to go fell a tree, we're going to have that thing inoculated and have no soil contact. I mean, by inoculated, I mean we're going to go through this plug process within just a couple of days. Now when the pollen counts down, the spore counts generally down, so that helps. Uh, so in January, you know, mid-December through uh, even March in some cases, it'll be okay, but we're going to store them in our greenhouses. We're not going to let them get cold and kind of freeze dry out there. And that allows us a little more time. Uh, another thing we've uh, run into is people are telling uh, their consumers to wax the ends of the log. Well, if you wax the ends of that log and you're going to try to shock this log, you actually inhibit the capillary draw that log still possesses. It doesn't have the ability to suck moisture in or transfer moisture, up moisture around. So it's actually more expensive and less productive to wax the ends of the log. Well, one of the most important things is recessing that plug. So if you take a look at that picture to give you an idea of scale, the little plug you see is one inch across by five sixteenths. And what we've done on several hundred logs is drill that out and actually take an awl and recess that plug all the way to the back of that cavity. That's a lot of work. We're not just drilling 25 holes, pounding 25 plugs in. We're going back and setting that back even farther. What's really cool about this picture is the mycelium that's grown in to fill that airspace. Our weather is very dynamic here in Minnesota. It goes all over the board. So what we found is by intentionally leaving a quarter inch air gap, we've created 25 microclimates all around uh, that log. Um, and that mycelium actually grew in to fill that air gap really before it started chewing through that cambium layer that you kind of see there. So this log, it was a shiitake that had fruited once. We busted out the chainsaw, cut her straight in half, and it told, a, told us a whole lot of information. So really, we don't let our logs sit. We don't wax the ends, and we don't recess the plugs. So we're doing much less work in a much shorter period of time. And what that has done is decrease the amount of time it takes for that mushroom to get established, and also decrease the amount of time between fruiting. So we've done less work for more food over a shorter period of time. However, what we still do, and I want to go back to this because it's a funny story, this is our inoculation rack. So we have one person drilling on one end, that log rolls down, the plugs get pounded in, the log rolls down, 
and then someone's waxing. We still wax those plug sites. It stops other fungal spores from getting in there. It helps the log retain moisture. Uh, stops critters from getting in there. So here in this picture, we used to use beeswax. We're an organic farm. Cool. Talk to one of our farmer buddies. Swap some mushrooms for some beeswax. Well, that's a bad idea. It gets really cold here. So we did that on 600 logs, and it got really cold that winter. All of that beeswax shrank, cracked, and fell off. And we had to rewax 600 logs. Cheese wax works great. It's inexpensive. It comes out of Wisconsin. Uh, canning wax, a soft paraffin. Almost all that works really well. Just unfortunately, beeswax doesn't. <clears throat> so back to that inoculation rack. We have one person drilling, one person pounding, and one person waxing. And that little... Uh, pan on that hot plate is a dangerous thing. It starts bouncing around and eventually that falls off and if that hits the hair on your legs that cheese wax will remove all the hair on your legs and trust me it doesn't always grow back. So we went to Walmart and got a nine dollar crock pot. Just one of those little tiny ones for little smokies. It is the best safety investment I think the farm has ever made. Uh, it's got rubber legs and it's stable. So, so once these logs are all inoculated we're going to stack them up and to conserve moisture. So here's some of our log rows that are just inoculated. Notice a few of them are tagged so we can keep track of the varieties, what varieties perform better than red oak, white oak, some of the pin oak, bur oak, soft maple, hard maple. And we can start tracking all that data like we've been doing for the last several years. This also helps them conserve moisture. If we actually get more than a week or two without rain, which we haven't for the last few years, we can run a soaker hose across the top to uh, minimize the amount of water we're using to actually keep those hydrated. And we wait. These things are perennial. Um, they have an establishment period just like any other perennial, 6 to 24 months or longer in some cases, depending on the species of mushroom, the time of year we inoculate, and the type of wood we put it in, and the size of the log, of course. So here's a great indicator of when those mushrooms are just about ready. This is a shiitake roll uh, that was sitting there getting established. And you notice a little white on the end of the log, and if you look at the top of the logs, if you guys can see my mouse, here's a little mycelium, here's an inoculation site. When we introduce that mycelium to an easy food source, it is omnidirectional. It runs in every direction, chewing through that as fast as it can. So we get these nice mycelial mats on the end. Once those are completely covered, once those mycelial spots kind of work together, we know that log is colonized. And if we want to, we can actually get our fruitings a little bit ahead of what Mother Nature has scheduled. In order to do that, that's where we pick that log up and we soak it in ice water for 48 hours. And again, I apologize, some of these pictures are still from 2012. Um, so once we pull that out of that ice water bath, uh, it warms up, it thinks it's spring, and we harvest, literally harvest mushrooms seven to 10 days after we remove it from that ice water bath. It's called shocking or forced fruiting log which works out slick for us because being by Brainerd, it's kind of tourist madness up here Memorial Day through Labor Day. So about mid-May, the shiitake start coming out of dormancy. And some of our late cold weather fruiters, we actually get to go harvest this weekend yet. So they're still producing for us. So once colonized, um, with the exception of that pink oyster, everything else we do is a zone two hardy perennial. This is one of our log fields in the winter. They just go dormant. One last thing for us to worry about in the winter, we can focus on the greenhouses and, and prepping the high tunnels for the next year. Um, on the right, we have our current record producer. That is 71 shiitakes on one two-foot log and one fruiting. And I tell everybody I talk to, if you get one like that from one of our strains, please give us a pick for the website because that's not normal. Uh, that was actually $24 worth of mushrooms wholesale off of one log and one fruiting. Now, by not putting those plugs down, by leaving those little air pockets, we can actually shock our logs every six weeks, run through that ice water bath, instead of every eight. So that reduces the amount of recovery time um, or, or time between fruitings, um, again, by doing less work. Work smart, not hard. These are some of those old three-footers. Um, at this point, picking up those logs would be very detrimental. Uh, we'd start to lose bark. The bark is the immune system of that log. The goal is to keep it intact as long as possible. So what we did uh, is actually run a soaker hose right across the top of those. We are fortunate to have very good well water. Um, run a soaker hose across those overnight, put our tarp across them, and then the following morning we came by with a framing hammer, and we just pounded the heck out of the top of those logs. Now they almost look like a steel drum. They've been cracked so many times. It's the same concept as that perfectly healthy tomato plant you have that's not giving you enough tomatoes. Give it a little pruning. Give it a little stress, and it leads to better fruit set.
same concept with the mushrooms when we're doing a log based cultivation. So now we can run a soaker hose, tarp those guys, we're not lifting them as much. We don't quite get the same amount of fruit set as we do if we were to give them a full submergence, but it's close enough and it's going to extend those logs for another season or two at this point. Last thing I want to cover here is we're kind of running out of time is we can take a red oak and a white oak log that are the exact same size, let's say two foot long and six inches in diameter, and put the exact same strain of shiitake mushroom in there. What we found is the red oak, which is a soft oak, or that soft maple like a box elder, is going to give us fruitings like we see on the right, just massive fruitings, but they tend to break down a little bit quicker. If we put that into that, again, that white oak, pin oak, burr oak, or hard maple, something a little more dense, we actually get less mushrooms every time that fruits, but it lasts much longer. So seven years of data is suggesting we're going to end up with the same amount of mushrooms just over a different amount of time because that fungus take, is taking longer to break down that more dense material. All right, guys, I knew I threw a lot of information at you very quickly. Um, Lara, is this uh, recording? Okay, and the website is www dot ready to fruit mushrooms dot com. Yep, and I forgot an S, didn't I? I just you saw did. that now. I am <laughs> glad you are on top of things. We literally produced uh, about seven hundred mushroom kits today, so I'm a little wrecked. Wow, that was a great class. That was a lot of great information, Matt. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar intro intro to mushroom cultivation. If you have any other questions, please co contact Matt or myself um, at Matt's email address or um, through his website there, or um, you can contact me through our website, www.northerngardener.org.